What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from the altar again with a thousand candles burning. And today we are returned with Kenny Hickey of Typo Negative Silver Tune and the new kick ass project I Am. Thank you so much for being here, man. Oh, I love that. Thank you for having me, man. What's with all the upside down crosses, dude? <laughs> yeah, I listen to a lot of uh, black metal. You're so evil. Yeah, right? Exactly. So evil, says the guy with the freaking Linkin Park tattoo. <laughs> yeah. but it's so awesome to have you here man I gotta tell you the new I Am Project I'm very stoked to hear more about it the new single Dreams Always Die With The Sun is an absolutely kick ass track is this maybe a good representation of what this whole uh, record is gonna sound like or is that just one little taste of what is to come I think that it's it definitely sets a precedent you know um, I, me and Kurt talking we're just talking just he's in Europe right now but he's emailing me and he's like, you know, I should do, you want me to set up some of my classic guitars? So we're, we're kind of like, the song is already driving the band towards like a classic rock edge, you know, yeah. more so than, than metal and doom. I mean, we've done so much metal and doom and me and, and, and Kirk in our fucking history that, you know, it's nice to uh, do something different. Absolutely. And uh, I, well, I've always seen different sides of everything you've done from, you know, like you could see differences between Typo and Seventh Void and Silver Tomb and now this as well. I think you've always been able to wear different hats and show different sides of yourself. And same thing with Kirk from his days with Crowbar and Kingdom of Sorrow and Down at that point. And his, and his solo stuff too. Yeah, so, you know. Of course. Okay. Yeah, he's got, you know, I mean, we don't want to keep repeating the same thing over and over again. I know a lot of times the fans, that's what they want. You know, they just want to hear the same shit over and over again. But, you know, I can't like... Can't, you can't live your life as an artist that way. You know, you're an artist. Yeah, of course. You know, you got to you gotta try new things. But in the end, was it almost kind of like combining your experiences together as musicians? Was it you, Johnny, and Kirk, and everybody being like, okay, you know, we got all this history together. Let's sort of throw it in one hodgepodge as a blender? Oh, I mean, or... absolutely. I, absolutely. It became what it is because of everybody, element of everybody adding stuff to it. So, I, you know, when I flew to, to Florida to meet these guys... I had one that verse riff, you know, the beginning of the song and the riff. That's all I had, you know, and uh, I sent it to Kurt. And then that, I guess, sparked the idea for the outro riff that he came up with, you know, the heavy outro riff. So all we did was throw those two. There was actually a hardcore part in the song. <laughs> Kurt wrote the hardcore part. We, we, he was thinking about throwing a hardcore part in the middle of the song, too. So we started, we got together in the room. And, you know, uh, and as soon as Johnny heard the riff, which I didn't even realize, he was like, Oh, that reminds you of Sly and the Family Stone. I'm like, yeah, I was thinking it was going to be ambient. You know, the band, and, and, like, with a lot of delay, and it just turned into this whole double-time, you know, funk thing almost, you know? Yeah. And it, it blasted off from there. Yeah, so everybody, everybody's additions to it made it what it was, you know? It sort of really organically became what it wanted to be when we all combined our our styles, you know? Yeah. I mean, our styles are what we're all about, but, like, just combined our fingers, you know, into it. Yeah, well, of course, but, you know, all the projects you've been involved in, with the exception of Typo, but like with Silver Tomb, for example, it doesn't sound like Typo meets Agnostic Front meets Inhuman, and this doesn't necessarily sound like Typo, Silver Tomb meets Crowbar and Down. It almost seems like you were able to lend all your talents together and kind of show, as I said before, different sides of yourselves. Yeah, I think it, I think all of us putting our two cents in and, and working it out like a band and getting excited about it and just running with the energy of it made it, it made its own thing. It's like, it's its own style that is, is separate than anything we've done individually, I think. Was there almost a vision behind this in a way though? Like, was it almost Kirk seeking out specific musicians in a way, or you seeking out specific musicians for this project? Uh, no, uh, it wasn't either me or Kirk or any of the band guys idea in the first place. It was Drew Spaulding. He's a, our buddy, mutual friend, old drinking buddy of me and Kirk's and Johnny's um, that came from New Orleans. He was, he was Typo's merch guy. That's how I met Drew, wow. right? Yeah, and like, you know, I first met Drew and I did uh, Black is the Black for Danzig. Um, I was at the La Park Hotel after the first rehearsal and I ran into him at the bar or whatever. And we got a bottle of vodka and went back to the room and that's it, we were fast buddies forever, you know? So, you know, fast forward ahead a little bit. He was living in New Orleans and, of course, running into Kirk at the bars and became really, really close drinking buddies and friends with Kirk. So 
he was always like, I wonder what would happen if I got you guys in a room together, you know, with some guitars and what would come out musically. So fast forward again, I get sober about three and a half years ago and so does Drew, right? He gets, he gets his shit together and he's like, I, I wanna make my dreams come true. I'm gonna start this record company, Corpse, Corpse Paint Records. And the first artist I wanted, he wanted to have was us doing, with his idea of just throwing us in a room and seeing what happened. And that's what happened in January. He was like, I want to get you guys together. You know, when are you, when are you guys available? He booked plane flights. He booked studio time on a hope and a prayer. You know, and wow. that was it. That's what we did. It sounded like it's very organic. And, and like, it almost seems very. like... And the people you meet in your past, you never know how they're going to help with your future in a way. One minute, the merch guy, the next minute, playing a role in something else. <laughs> it's funny because Jamie Joss had the same idea years ago, too, when we were playing together. You know? You know, when, when I did the Kingdom of Sorrow run and stuff. But, like, I guess everybody always thought about it. You know, um, we kind of, we're, we're cut a lot from the same musical stone. Me, Kurt, Todd, and of course, Johnny. So, it, it, it's kind of obvious. Why didn't we ever play together, you know? So, it just, it finally came to fruition. It finally happened. Yeah. And, you know, boom, it was so easy. The song came out in two days and recorded. And I can't wait to see what more. I mean, I'd imagine you have a whole record at this point ready to go, right? If you're allowed to say it. Uh, no, I'm painting over stuff right now. I can't write a whole record, right? So because I want it, I want it, I want it to grow the same way Dreams Always Die With The Sun happened. You know, I want it to be organic, you know? So I don't want to finish anything. I got verse ideas, some riff ideas. I'm going to send them over in the same way we did the last song. And leave the rest to everybody else. We'll be getting to a room, throw it together. And see what happens. Yeah. I know it's risky, but hey, I mean that's the kind of energy that that produced the last song. So, well, and simple songs in you guys—that's never been a—that's a, never been a thing either, especially especially with your history, right? I know. Yeah. Well, you know, I try to write simple, and it always ends up not being. Yeah. <laughs> the simplest song I think I've ever heard you do was "Last Walk in the Line" off the Seventh Void album, which is a fantastic song. Like that's. Yeah. A, that's a really uh, hard hitting song for me, but like I think that was as simple as it gotten. Yeah, one of them definitely. Yeah. Um, when it comes to like every project you've been involved with, too, is it showing a different side of who you personally are in a way, or in the end, everything you've done, it's Kenny all the way through? I no, I think every project brings out something different or a different side, you know, and it's highly dependent on the individuals you're working with and the energy at the time in your life too right i mean write different shit at different times in your life you know yeah so um but the thing is with seven Floyd or with with silver tomb that's a lot of that's me you know and um the guys pitch in but like too much of it i feel is me and i really love the way this is going i love working off of other artists you know i, I think it's a more organic, better way. I think the best bands work that way, the like Beatles, Zeppelin, Sabbath, you know. So I'm really excited about that. I mean, even in Typo, we never worked like this. I mean, we did, in the end, we did, like, um, the last two, three albums of Typo, a lot of it was jamming in the studio, you know, with ideas. But a lot of it was very plotted, and then, you know, uh, we did a lot of pre-production, and then Peter mathematically plotted everything out, and we went to the studio. It was never like shooting from the hip, you know, going into a rehearsal studio. All right, we got some parts, put them together. You know, writing lyrics on the way to the studio, you know, it was never like that, you know. So it's really like shooting from the hip, and it's, it's fun. It's terrifying, but it's fun. Well, this is like a sort of interesting question I wanted to ask, because, you know, in the end, a band is compromised of, you know, four to five individuals. And whenever people come together and I ask them how the making of an album is, and they say, oh, it was all collective and mutual. We all came together. I don't believe it. Because if you're in a band no. with four to five people and you're writing a dozen or so songs and you all have different experiences, I'm not going to necessarily say there has to be disagreement, but I'd imagine you can't all be in the same headspace emotionally, right? But that has to help the music in a way. Yeah, I think that... Um Everybody has a position in their place. You know what I mean? I mean, there's also help, having guys help arrange. If, you, if you're working with guys, so this is the thing about me, Johnny, Kurt, and Todd. We're all about the same age group. We grew up in the same era. We became musically aware 
like Johnny's a little more later seventies, me, Todd and, 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 and Kirk more earlier seventies and became musically aware, you know, and evolved from, you know, rock of the hard rock of the seventies into the metal of the eighties. We all come from the same place. So there's not too many arguments. We do kind of agree on how stuff is going to go. There might be some bumps, a little bumps and grinds, you know, on like whatever a drum fill or where it should go or something like that. But I don't usually argue anyhow with Johnny, whatever he wants to do any, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and then also we have like, we, we had an approach with this one and we did with Silvertune too, where whoever plays the part best first gets to, play, gets to play it. You know, it makes the most sense. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't have a problem with this. You try. I mean, I was, I was, um, uh, uh, Roger Lima was it sat me down to do the lead in the song too, you know, and I was kind of fucking around, frustrated. And I was like, I, I don't know, and I gave it to Kurt, and he blasted that lead out in two seconds, man. There you go, you know what I mean? So, it's it, that's the way we've been rolling with this so far, and I'm sure sooner or later we're gonna have an argument, and yeah. something's gonna, maybe not an argument, but a disagreement on which way to go with something. I mean, there always is. Yeah. You grew up in the same era, but I, I think one big difference is the scenes you grew up. I mean, you're a New Yorker. You were hanging out in the hardcore scene and all that stuff. And, you know, Kirk coming from New Orleans and, you know, cutting his teeth with Down as well. And, you know, uh, more hanging out in, you know, a completely different city and whatnot. I'd imagine that those differences really have to, I don't want to say collide like it's a bad thing, but that really has to bring I contrast. Think, I, I think they unify us because, like, you know, Kirk was into the hardcore scene too. You know, he was into Carnival. He was into all those bands as well. He's been a fan of that stuff for years. So he, if you listen to his evolution, which starts probably with Elton John, just like I did, I don't believe it does. And then it evolves to, you know, Zeppelin, Sabbath, Kiss, you know, um, and then into the metal days, into like Metallica and Slayer. And then he got into the hardcore stuff. It's the same evolution I had, exactly. Yeah. I never understood how there was a difference between hardcore and metal. Like, and this could just be my age speaking, but like, I never understood how somebody who likes Slayer or Anthrax or Megadeth or Metallica couldn't appreciate uh, an agnostic front or a sick of it all or a minor threat or something like that. They're both I think they can. I think it crosses over. You know, it's been proven in the past that it crosses over. But often, um, I think metalheads feel a lot of metalheads feel that hardcore and punk is not refined enough for them which is the point of hardcore and punk you know what i mean they don't yeah. get that part of and then the hardcore punk guys think the metal guys are poses and phony you know what i mean so it's it, there's always been that yeah that pull that given pull between the, the two genres but you're right there's I love both genres, so. Yeah, and and I think Typo Negative was a bridge between hardcore and metal uh, long before metalcore was even a thought because when you listen to Slow, Deep, and Hard, I mean, I think that is a significant bridge between the two. Well, yeah, it was, uh, yeah the, the, the goal of Slow, Deep, and Hard was to combine the elements of hardcore, metal, rock, um, dirge, goth, and, and industrial noise. Yeah. You were combining many genres together and before. That, that's the thing about that album, you know, and that album, you know, I know there's a lot of typo fans now. They like the dark stuff, the later stuff and stuff like that. But that album, there was never an album like that before it or even since. No, I, I disagree. Really fucking original. You know, it was a combination of elements that were just out out of this off this planet you know i i mean like and i agree like i love that album i like the whole typo catalog but there's something about like i feel like with bloody kisses life is killing me october rust even dead again etc there's always stuff that maybe combines those records together but with and i also think with slow deep and hard a lot of bands have this it has the debut charm behind it it has that underground innocence and that charm behind it that you you can never replicate even if you tried well there's a realism to it you know it's great of course. It's real, real grit, you know, and it, it pushes a lot of boundaries. Definitely. Lyrically, obviously, lyrically, and musically. Oh, of course. I mean, I, I, I think I know you're fucking someone else. That, to me, is the ultimate sing-along song compared to any, I don't care what is being played at Duff's or Lucky 13, that, to me, is the ultimate sing-along song. Well, the album comes from an artist that had, number one, as an artist, nothing to lose, and just everything to express. That's it was it's pure real expression of how he was feeling. That yeah. record of how he was feeling. It represents that a man who loses everything is capable of anything. 
Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, you know, it's a love story. Yep, uh, I'll, I'll, and the greatest love story of all time. Now, mm -hmm. uh, there was a couple typo questions I wanted to ask. There's a big anniversary this year that I know a lot of diehard old school typo fans are excited about. 20 years of life is killing me is this year. So uh, I wanted to know uh, what the sort of mindset was because that I know that I Don't Want to Be Me was you challenging Peter to write a bit of a simple song, but Anesthesia and, you know, We Are Electric... Uh, Electrocute. That's and, my favorite song on record. That's uh, my favorite song on Electrocute? Anesthesia. Oh, Anesthesia. Anesthesia. Well, I think when you trust someone, illusion has begun is one of the most is significant quotes I've ever heard in a song. And then, you know, with a track like How Could You as well, it's just, what was the sort of mindset in 2003 going uh, into the making of that? Utter chaos. Our Peter was like off on the deep end. I was off on the deep end with my addictions. It was like rehearsing in Brooklyn in the studio. All of our friends there drunk and strangers in the room. It was, it was ridiculous chaos. Peter coming to the studio unprepared, like no riffs. And yeah, that's how it was built. It was built out of complete fragments and chaos. You've always been an artist who's known how to express his demons, which I think is why so many people hold you as an inspiration. And you know, it's always good that you're able to create that catharsis, but when darkness and negativity is sort of like the fuel behind your fire, does that maybe also make the songwriting process just as deteriorating as it can be cathartic? Yes, yeah. When, when there's no hope in the room and you're trying to create, it's not, it's not conducive to the creative process. <laughs> you know, it's not fun. I mean, the creative process isn't fun, period. I don't think it's fun. Anyhow, I mean, the only time it's fun to me is when this brilliant thing just suddenly comes to you out of thin air, which happens, but not often. You know, as an artist, you get an idea comes in, something comes in, you know, and, and you usually got to work on it. Yeah. You, know, you got to work on the fraud, you got to paint over it. So if you add to that, um, four very frustrated negative personalities in a room, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, man. It's a hard struggle, you know? And then, it, it was never like, type of was never the band like, oh man, that was great. Yeah, great job. We would never pat each other on the back. It was the exact opposite, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's just Brook. I think that's just Brooklyn in, in general, right? It's like you're running head first into a wall, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and creating hypo stuff. Mm -hmm. And that whole suffering thing, I'd imagine too, the most deteriorating thing is when you want to create, you have the idea or you have that energy but you can't either because you're in the middle of something, whether it be work or, you know, you are, you know, out at a show or something like that. To me, like having that creative energy, but not being able to create is almost like holding in, like having to hold in going to the bathroom in a way. It's like that type of feeling. Uh, I think it's even worse than that, man. It's, uh, it, it, um, I think it warps me inside. If I, if I can't create, if I can't do this, if I can't make music, if I can't make something, I would, Emotionally go downhill would, in six months. You know, I would yeah. probably come suicidal. I can't. I have to. That's why I keep doing this. That's why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the age I am right now, and I keep creating and I keep pushing forward because I don't have a choice. It's what I got to do. Yeah, of course. I, I, it, we don't create because we want to. We create because we have to. Right. Exactly. Yep. It's now, not a choice. Of course. Now, I know you get asked about this album all the time. This year is also 30 uh, years of Bloody Kisses, so um, which I believe was the first record to come out in my lifetime, like I think, well, being born in 93. I think that was the first record to like come out while I was in this world. So um, I just want to know, like between Bloody Kisses, because it almost seemed like that had to have been a very, very... Um, revolutionary record in the typo negative it had to have represented a turning point because going from you know slow deep and hard to um you know origin of feces then going to bloody kisses that had to have been a significant turning point and there was a transition you know when you think about um origin of the feces it started becoming more melodic you know we had hey pete on there we had things on there you know so the thing was is that um we wanted to add more melody to it and really like the whole like scene with Cock Cocteau Twins and Red House Painters and this later uh, 80s trans dance stuff and and the goth stuff your Bauhaus and stuff like that and wanted to incorporate those elements because it was fun we're just having fun we used to go out to limelight Wednesday night goth night every week me and Peter and get drunk there's like 10 people there but like you know 
dancing around. Yeah. I mean, it was just fun hanging out in Alphabet City. And um, wanted to add that, add that kind of like Halloween kind of fun and candor to the band, you know? And we were just having fun with it. That's, that's, that's what happened with Bloody Kisses. It wasn't like we thought we were making something groundbreaking or anything like that. We were just playing around and having fun. And you and I know that you guys have always wanted to portray the Halloween style, but there was also just the romantic style behind it. I mean, I've heard somebody call Typo Negative the Barry White of heavy metal. So, oh, I can hear that. Yeah, yeah, it, it evolved into that. It definitely did. Yeah. So, did did part it went of from, it went from a psychotic Barry White to to the lover Barry White. <laughs> <laughs> and then back to psychosis. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's the perfect time. Like, love, insanity, horror, and darkness, and the macabre made beautiful is how I describe your whole catalog. It's all very honest stuff. You know, it really um, sort of represents everything we were doing or going through at the time. You know, Throughout your career, has there ever been a time, whether it was with Typo or Seventh Void, Silver Tomb, or now with I Am, it, it, has there ever been a time where maybe in your music you did portray an element outside of yourself where something did serve as like an external metaphor in a way. Yes, definitely. I've written songs about people. Oh, I've written a lot of songs about my wife, for that matter. But um, other people too. I mean, I'm not going to drop any names, but yeah. sometimes, you know, you can't just keep cannibalizing your own experience. You know, you got to look at outside yourself. And, but this a never ending material and all the people you know around you, you know, they're all fucked up too, so. <laughs> Everybody's fucked up in their own way. Yeah, right. Yep. So use that. You got to use that shit. That's one thing about Peter, man. He used everything. He had the sound of train tracks on it, you know, because he was listen, used to listen to the D train going down King's Highway. You know, everything he heard or experienced during the day, he ended up incorporating it through music. Which, I mean, it seems like inspiration is like water. It is everywhere. It's everywhere if you're looking, if you're open to it. You got you to gotta be open to it. Well, do you believe inspiration really is something that could be sought out, or does inspiration have to strike you when you least expect it? What I think is, what I know is this. Not so much sought out. What you need to do, it's not going to just come, because you ask it to come. You need to sit down with whatever your medium is, and you need to put the time in. Hours. And then you know how it goes. You're screwing around in the first hour and everything you're doing is not too good. You don't like it. And then suddenly, somewhere two hours, three hours later, something strikes you like a lightning bolt and just happens. You have to make yourself available for inspiration or else you'll never come. Yeah, of course. You have to, you have to, you can't wait for it to come, but you have to be available for when it does come. You've got to be working. You have to be working. You have to be working whatever you with your paintbrush, me sitting with my guitar. I had to be sitting with my guitar for hours, you know, and then suddenly something will strike right out of nowhere. Something I couldn't have even have predicted, you know. Definitely. Depending but if I'm not there with my guitar, nothing's going to happen. Well, inspiration has a habit of striking at the most inconvenient times too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the final question. You know, was, what? But you know, now there's not really too many inconvenient times because I always got my phone on me. can always sing it right into my phone or whatever, you know. Part of me wonders how many different ideas you all would have had if you had your phone back in the 80s or 90s or early 2000s. Well, let's, let's look at it this way. I, I, I have this phone, right, this phone account now, and is an uncountable of my, I, amount of ideas in it from 2012 on. Uncountable. And I, you can go through my phone and hear the, the riffs and stuff and me sitting in my room with just my electric and no amp and, and the stuff that turned into um, Silver Tomb, that whole record, and you can see the, you can hear the evolution of the songs. You know, I, there's a ton of. You. I've always said the fir like, never ever give a record label your phone because I'm always worried that a record label, like God forbid, somebody passes or something, they're gonna take your phone and release all those MP3s, even if uh, they're terrible, because people are gonna want to hear them. Yeah, well, as artists, you don't ever want anything released that you didn't actually uh, refine and, and make releasable. You know? Yeah, the artist may not want, but the people working for the artist do. Mm -hmm. um, and the final question I wanted to ask you is: depending on what you're singing about, depending on what you're writing about, depending on what the ins the source of inspiration was, does it resonate with you differently when you are playing that? Does it almost channel a different energy into it? 
Um, sometimes it becomes its own thing. Yeah, it starts as a as an idea, you know, um, a focus on a feeling, whatever, and um, laying it makes you feel more aggressive about it or more angry about it. It could change your, sometimes changes my attitude about it, yeah. Yeah, and it's it almost seems like because some artists write about historical references and some artists write about the past, the present, or the future. So part of me wonders, are you really channeling the same emotion into that? Well, you know, um, to me, a music is an emotional conduit. That's what it should be. But not to all musicians, it isn't. I mean, a lot of musicians, like I said, I mean, if you're, if you're writing about, you know, Indians or whatever, how can you have any emotional attachment to it? Yeah. Let's face it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you know? <laughs> of course. That's a good way to sum this up. So uh, before we go, I want to thank you so much for coming back on. And it's always great talking with you. Just, oh, always awesome talking to you, dude. Oh, anytime, man, anytime. Is there just uh, anything else with I Am that we could be expecting? Because I definitely want to be hearing more and I can't wait to hear more. What, if you're allowed to say, when could we be expecting more? Um, I don't know exactly when soon, but we're going, I'm going to New Orleans the tw- next week. I'll be in New Orleans with the guys writing and recording. We got 11 days. We're going to see what we can come up with in 11 days. We came up with that song in two days. We'll see what we can come up with in 11 days. Oh, I'm excited. I'm excited. And you're good planning on taking this live too? Yeah, absolutely. Of course. Okay. That's always the ultimate, ultimate plan goal. Why don't you all do like a, a a bill of all of your projects? So get like right. a crowbar, silver tomb, I am. I think that's the only way it's going to be possible to happen. Because <laughs> everybody's so busy doing other shit, you know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. But thank you so much, everybody. Kenny Hickey of Typo Negative, Seven Void, Silver Tomb, and I Am. Be sure to check out their newest single, Dreams Always Die with the Sun. This is Alex from Heavy New York, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Alex.